um, has a lot of different roles, and I'm just going to highlight two for now. Um, for one, um, B was um, is a member of the directory of the Planetary Society. If you're not familiar with them, I suggest you look at their website. They're an advocacy society. Um, what stands out to me about them are, are a few things. Firstly, they're longevity. They've been around since the 80s. Secondly, their political clout. They really have influenced a lot of decisions um, on, in the political sphere regarding space exploration. And thirdly, their um, achievements. Uh, they've got a lot of interesting projects that they've, they've run over the years. Um, in addition, B is uh, the regional, um, sorry, the regional coordinator for the Asia Pacific regions for the Space Generation Advisory Committee, which I believe has a United Nations affiliation as well. Um, but what they do is they are working with younger generations um, with regards to space exploration. Um, and today she's going to be talking about um, from romance to reality. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jill. And I must admit, I have to start off with a couple of notices. I have a very difficult spot to speak at today because I'm following none other than the father of sort of all the lunar activities um, in Europe. So, um, you know, someone uh, I greatly admire and thank you very much, Bernard. That was amazing. So, what you will also find is that we're all working in different organizations, sort of as a secret society, to almost on a mission to, to bring all of the public messages, all of the science, all of the great work about what our space, a place in space is and where we come from uh, to you. So there will be a reputation of certain messages. Um, as Bernard mentioned, consider this the first day of your school at the Republic of the Moon. So there will be an examination as you go out the door. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a slight um, deviation from what normally I talk about as an engineer and someone who's been sort of studying um, the type of robotic systems that will um, essentially harness resources on the moon for longer term missions. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll deviate from that today to really sort of bring to you a little bit of an interdisciplinary message and I hope this is something that we can build on together. Um, but I thought that um, I, I shall use, um, I shall put my uh, own background of, of being almost an international citizen, coming from Asia, um, learning a lot about um, three different cultures growing up and working very closely with the international community um, at the Space Generation Advisory Council as well as the Planetary Society to bring a slightly different perspective today. And, um, in, in doing that, in, in trying to sort of work out what would be of, of interest today to you um, uh, with Rob, um, we thought it would be interesting to sort of actually present a journey of uh, a few new players um, in, in the sort of lunar exploration game um, to you in, in sort of personified as how their mythological characters have journeyed to the moon and now are part of our efforts to understand our place and the moon's place in our world. So, here it goes. Um, Ray Bradbury, if, if you, um, has anyone hear, heard of Ray Bradbury? Yeah. Excellent, <laughs> great. So, uh, he's seldom a name that requires introduction, but uh, he's an author, sort of a contemporary uh, American author, and wrote something called the Mars Chronicles um, that have inspired scientists for generations about longer term living on, um, living on Mars. And he said this at one point, it is the part of nature of man to start with romance and build to a reality. And um, I chose this particular image to go with this because this is actually the Ray Bradbury landing site. So when um, the uh, NASA landed the Opportunity rover uh, onto Mars, they named the, the landing site as the Ray Bradbury site. So here it is, a man, you know, here it is uh, where a man's words become reality. The, the romance he set out to create a vision of us living on, the Mar on Mars. Now he's there, and this place hopefully we'll visit someday in our future. So I'll start off by talking about our connection with the moon, um, you know, why we really need to explore it, um, what does it really tell us, and then 
look at the journey, as I said, of a few beloved characters um, of different cultures on how they were ended up uh, as part of the moon now. And you may consider the question that, you know, everybody seems to be doing this. Is this easy? So we'll look at that um, in, in a lesser analytical way, but um, certainly something that I hope you'll get involved in discussing. And then some emerging opportunities. So let's start off with a quick experiment. I want you all to close your eyes and for what, record in your mind, remember in your mind the first uh, image that you think of when I say picture the moon. Okay, please open your eyes. How many of you had a crescent moon in your minds? Please raise your hand. Ah, so we've got about five people in the audience. Most of you um, possibly thought of something as the full moon. So let's have a show of hands for how many of us? Okay, yeah. So <laughs> normally when I've done this experiment before, it's been about 80% of the room. But this is, you know, this, this is um, a striking resemblance across all of humanity for me. I think that whenever we all think of the moon, we think of this image. So in wherever you are in the world, this is something to remember. This is something that binds us all. Now, if you consider, um, you know, go back a few hundred years, and actually Bernard uh, already showed one of these images, but this is Galileo's very detailed um, uh, maps of the moon. I mean, he, he published this as the maps of the moon in something called the Starry Messenger Journal that he used to, um, uh, he, he sort of um, spearheaded for many years. But he used these particular images to really talk and bring about the case of the, um, the changing phases of the moon for him uh, were an evidence that, um, uh, you know, that challenged the status quo at the time, that um, it was very much believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and the solar system. But he used this to help uh, create an awareness that there is actually a larger Earth-moon system at play um, to, you know, him being rather unpopular in his time <laughs> because of this specific reason. But the moon has helped us and, you know, to find our own sort of um, explanation about our place um, in our solar system and the universe. This is um, something sort of uh, from a 15, um, so 15,000 BC prehistoric um, uh, pictures uh, found in a cave uh, near the southern part of France. And this is something we believe that um, you know, was keeping people aware of the, the calendar, the time cycles, and was being the basis of our preliminary sense of how time passes and how to really survive seasons um, back in the day when uh, Europe had an ice age around it. So go even further back in history, and this is part of um, what we call the tidal rhythmites, and this is something um, found, um, you know, in southern uh, Australia. And you can actually go and visit these. These are the evidences around the, the tidal variation. So they, they mark um, every year, essentially, around uh, what was the early Earth Moon system. And we believe that um, the days at that point in the early moon uh, Earth system were actually only 22 hours long. The, the Earth was spinning much faster. And as Bernard already pointed to, it was the moon's effect that allowed it to stabilize its axis. And um, due to that, that uh, stabilizing effect, we actually have much, um, much more homogeneous uh, variation in temperature across our poles and equator, that means that um, that stabilization of the climate actually allowed several multicellular organisms to develop. And that that's something that really is very rare to find uh, in the rest of the, the universe. And um, you know, here is one instance where we've yet never found this effect to actually be able to find a place which can nurture um, large multicellular organisms. And it's really only possible because we have the moon. Also, 
also, the moon is the only place that humans have set foot upon. Um, so that's uh, something that we all very well know about. Um, but I won't go into the details of, of all the missions because Bernard covered quite a lot of it and I know that um, Marek has got some details to, to share as well. But like I said, there's a test at the end, so <laughs> just be careful. Um, but, but we uh, uh, just want to touch on one thing, that um, there are a lot of um, opinions about sort of the, the Apollo missions, and we can discuss some of that in the, the Q&As later. But um, several people have sort of mentioned that they were the most costliest missions ever done. Um, and you know there is there was a lot of science done, but I don't think that it is as well known in the public domain. So uh, again, day two of the Republic of the Moon session later on. <laughs> but here is one um, sample return that I would say for me answers the question of why we ever need to go to the moon. So this is sample um, with a kind of funny uh, numeric title sample. 76215. Um, th this is actually a microscopic view of the sample taken under polarized light, and it's only 0.7 microns um, wide. But it is one of the samples brought back um, from the Apollo 17 landing site, and it is the only type of rock that is actually from an asteroid or uh, mineral that has never been else found either on the moon surface or on Earth. But it allows us to date the exact um, uh, kind of era in which the heavy bombardment of early Earth and moon system took place. And, and this is sort of essentially what uh, a signature of our formation <laughs> looks like. So that's, for me, it answers exactly what time um, in the early universe can we place ourselves and our solar system developing. And I hope that this reason will develop a lot more into um, a, a sort of surge, a push, uh, almost a movement such that we can uh, end up with a moon as a working base towards our journey to Mars. I'll touch upon very briefly again at this uh, later on. But let's go back to this journey of romance to reality. And I've got three examples. Um, we have um, the Kaguya Him uh, from Japan, Chandra from India and early Tibet, and Chandra. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about these very beloved characters. So one of the oldest and the best known Japanese stories about, well, anything really, is the one about Kaguya um, Him, which is um, the, the kind of Japanese for moon princess. And it starts about as um, a, a Japanese bamboo cutter finds a little uh, very beautiful baby in uh, a bamboo shoot. And his wife and he uh, rear this, um, uh, this baby up to be a beautiful princess. And um, it, there's a, a sort of funny play around whether uh, you know, she is quite an ambitious young lady and does not want to be married off to the emperor or other suitors, and hence gets transported to the moon and she lives there forever. Um, Chandra, um, I'll, I'll go back into sort of some more detail around uh, the Chandra uh, stories as well later, but uh, Chandra is the moon god. Um, Chandra is the Sanskrit name for um, the moon. Um, and we actually still, in India, growing up, you, you call the moon Chandamama. It means the maternal uncle. And it means, uh, you know, the, the sentiment is that um, the moon is always looking after you. And Chunga is, is um, a beloved Chinese character. Again, a princess from the moon. Um, well, actually, she's meant to be sort of someone from Earth who steals the pill of immortality and moves over to uh, the moon and is, is almost banished there forever with her uh, beloved Jade Rabbit, which was uh, you 2 So those are the, the stories. And let's see how they have ended up on the moon. So here is um, when Japan uh, decided to um, announce its mission, it also asked its public what would be the name that is suitable for the Japanese effort to go to the moon. And 
uh, resoundingly, I think they, they, they received something around a thousand candidate options, of which about you know most of them revolved around the the China, uh, Japanese legend of um, Kaguya. So the mission was named Kaguya. Um, in English, we also refer it. Uh, in a rather kind of convoluted scientific acronym that says Selene, but uh, that is also the moon goddess, the Greek name for it. Um, but also, um, Kaguya carried with it two different microsatellites, Ona and Okina, which mean elder, um, uh, uh, elder man and elderly woman, and it refers to the, the parents of um, Kaguya Hime that um, you know, adopted her and uh, raised her to be this beautiful moon princess. Um, just Kaguya Selina at a very quick glance. I've kind of added the, the budget in, I, I do apologize if you can't see um, the slide, I, I shall try and read it out to you. Um, so I've added the budgets of all of these um, missions as, as a very quick kind of connection to what they mean um, to us when we are looking at you know, the, the budgetary considerations in the UK around science spending. Um, but this was a, a roughly $2.46 billion uh, mission. And uh, although it sounds, I, I heard some laughter there, although it sounds actually quite a large number, uh, in military and space spending, it really isn't that big. Um, I'm sure we'll have a, a, a debate on that later. <laughs> but key findings, so Kaguya was actually a very, very, uh, you know, very interesting mission because it allowed the, uh, us to ha have a detailed profile of the gravity anomalies. So Burnett touched on this earlier, but um, the gravity um, on the moon not only depends on the topography of the um, place where you are, but also uh, how much uh, subsurface water or the composition of the metals underneath it. So um, he's, he's already showed me the maps, I wouldn't go into too much detail of it, but we understood for the first time how different was the near side to the far side, and that's quite important when you're trying to work out how will you land things there, or how will you establish permanent presence there. Um, we also had uh, the detailed topographical uh, profile of the moon, so which is very important around choosing um, future landing sites. Illumination profile, so again, part of this has been um, already discussed around peaks of eternal sunlight. So when we say eternal sunlight, it's still about 98% uh, sunlight over the year. And um, Kaguya also carried the first HD TV camera, which is very exciting because we could finally see, uh, you know, HD versions of, of lunar flyovers. Um, and if anyone is interested in thinking, well, how can I get involved, and, and is there data available to me for any of my art projects? Um, I, I think some of the best ways to communicate the the, the science and the messages that we find. Uh, from these missions is actually by having artists look at it and uh, you know, uh, make it available in a way that engages all the different um, disciplines and, and everyone's uh, interest. So if you are interested in um, getting the data, there is a link here. I shall make that, uh, I, sh I shall pass on all the slides to um, uh, Robin and the team here so that they can be on the website. But here's the, the first uh, HD image of the moon that we saw, and this is a great, um, you, know, you can just sort of feel you're almost flying over it. I do have a little video later on that we can all enjoy um, with it. So I've, I've talked um, very quickly uh, around the, the three characters. I won't go uh, too much deep into it. I've just been given a time warning. So. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, but let's go on to talking about Chandrayaan. So uh, when, when India decided to do its first lunar shot, so moon shot was sort of outer space, uh, first exploratory mission as we call it, because most of India's space activities had been um, space application based, um, being able to kind of derive a knowledge that is actively used for its society in day-to-day -day, uh, context. Um, 
So Chandrayaan, um, you know, not as long a, a, a path, flight path as a, a, a smart one, but um, pretty much the, the sort of um, flight capabilities that we've seen uh, in, in the Apollo missions and some other uh, missions that have been talked about today. Um, but what was interesting was it was the first time that India was engaging in, in this sort of an investment. And it, it, it really was um, a few years uh, of public debate around whether we should be um, investing in, um, in activities which, in some respects, you know, the, on the world stage, they look like a competitive race to the moon, but all of these missions are trying to do different things. So um, it's not a show of power, but is it something that we can afford to do with, given the, the priorities of, of the government? So just as a quick glance now, um, the budget for Chandrayaan-1 was 62 million. So you can compare it that to, to the other missions that we've seen today and talked about. And it was a collaborative mission, so it wasn't uh, sort of, you know, as we kind of talk about a moon race, uh, it wasn't in the older days where there is no dialogue on an international level. Um, ESA, as already Bernardo said, was involved in, in the mission uh, with instruments, so was NASA, so was the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And it, uh, it really was a demonstrator mission. Let's find out what we can do um, to develop, launch, and orbit around the moon. Um, it, of course, had, uh, as part of this collaboration, very detailed uh, mineral mapping. Uh, you already saw the, the three color graphs of the, the moon surface, where Bernard pointed out the, the OH um, embedded um, regolith uh, on the poles. Uh, so it, so it essentially led to the discovery of the OH uh, molecule on a uh, lunar surface. It also categorized lunar highland rocks. So part of what you saw on the far side is lots of highland. Um, it, it helped to actually understand what type of rocks there were. And uh, there was a discovery of a new type of lunar rock as well. So uh, again, something that added to our collective knowledge. And it, it looked at the diversity of lunar volcanism, and that's really important for us to understand because when this bombardment took place and the early Earth moon system was born, um, the moon actually is one of the more heavier um, moons in the solar system, and it didn't cool in the same way from the near side or the far side. Again, maybe an effect of the uh, early Earth. Um, but it, this difference in temperature uh, led to sort of a different rate of cooling, hence we see a, a very vast difference in its rocks. And it's important to understand this because at some level um, we will need to know this if we are to use the, the resources on the moon, if we are to use those particularly to live there longer, or to make use of them to, um, uh, for onward journeys um, far into deep space. And it also soft landed um, a small probe at, um, into the Shackleton crater, again, one of the big craters that you saw on the North Pole, and um, Bernard showed us the, the data from it. And again, there is open data available for anyone who wants to use it for any sort of project. Project B, just a change point. You said impact soft land. What is that? What does that mean? So, uh, so the, a little pro, the, well, um, like it was, it was essentially crash landed, but but in a way that um, it was controlled, and um, we were looking for again um, signs of whether there is ice around there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and this is one of the first images it sent back. So this is. Uh, Probably one of the first images, well, we sent from the moon, 40,000 um, kilometers away, centered on India. And if you have been following um, the, the news lately, India's also sent a Mars orbiter mission, which sent a very similar false color image that sort of projects uh, the Earth in kind of Martian colors, pretty much with the same view. So now we have uh, a lunar view and a Martian view for, um, you know, our world as well. Um, Changa, 
So, in my opinion, China has uh, probably shown us uh, a very systematic approach to all the lunar missions. It has a very systematic uh, timeline towards first demonstrating a mission, then uh, orbiting, landing, and doing, it's ultimately working towards a goal of sample return, after which, as Bernard said, there is a new decade of human activities. Um, so part of the tale around Chang'e um, includes also uh, her pet rabbit, Jade Rabbit. So this is um, Jade Rabbit uh, U U2, which is the, the rover, and Chang'e here, Chang'e 2. But also, um, uh, I, I felt that it, it, it was quite important to also say that there's a huge amount of ground element that goes into sending something to the moon. There is years of um, uh, analog studies and testing, prototyping, and um, the place where this was uh, carried out uh, was at, has been named by um, the, the Chinese officials as, as the Wangshu site. And Wangshu is, again, uh, a sort of combined uh, pre-6th century Han Dynasty, uh, Japanese and Chinese moon goddess with a chariot of dragons on the moon. So there you go. I think, um, again, like I said, this is all part of the, the revision for the test, but um, uh, Bernard showed, I think, this image, uh, which is from the LRO. So this is uh, the landing site without, uh, you know, this is before Chang'e and the rover was, uh, were on the moon. And I'm terribly sorry for anyone at the back, but we'll, we'll make sure you have these pictures and, and all the slides. But you can see two very sharp shadows, so very bright objects with long shadows, and they are the, um, the, the landing, um, uh, sort of the lander and the, the rover. So just two around here. And this is the, the cute little U2 rover. Um, it actually captivated everyone um, because it has been blogging, uh, it has been tweeting on Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter site. And it's um, incredible because it uses very humanized language. It, it, um, it has been very emotional. It calls the landing, um, the, well, the, the landing module its master. And um, uh, the landing module also micro, micro blogged as the rover being the third sister. Uh, so there's a, a lot of story, a lot of uh, pride involved in it, and I feel that it's a very important part in which art and culture of an entire very rich civilization has been built into <laughs> something that is delivering very actual science. Um, this is something that is very true about sort of humanity, and I'm, I'm very proud that um, the Chinese have taken it all the way to the moon. So just at a glance, I mean, part of this slide, obviously because the, the Chang'e 3 mission is still ongoing, part of this slide is actually uh, just on Chang'e 2. Um, I can see a lot of people squinting their eyes, but I, I'll read it out again. Um, so I've got the, uh, a budget figure for the Chang'e 2 um, as 134 million uh, US dollars. Um, and Key findings from, from Chang'e 2, and um, so this is one, two, three, as in because they're all three missions. Um, first of all, it started off as a demonstration mission. They've done that very, very well. Um, Chang'e 2 was the only orbiter that has not only orbited the moon, but then extended its mission to um, travel up to Lagrange point two. And it's further on gone on to do the, close, um, the closest flyby of any asteroid. Um, and it's going across to about 100 million kilometers into deep space so that China can use its uh, deep space tracking and telemetry operations. Also amongst the primary of its objectives was, um, uh, was uh, demonstrating that there was presence or calculating how much uh, presence of helium-3 was in the lunar soil. And um, it has also done an incredible amount of work to help us map the solar radiation and um, solar wind effects around the Moon-Earth system. And one of the things that we, we talk about the kind of uh, the rover in, in a rather kind of cute humanized <laughs> sense, but actually it is, uh, by lunar standards, almost a race car. 
Um, if you consider the rovers on Mars, they go about five meters per, se uh, per, per minute. <laughs> so they're quite, quite slow, almost sort of, um, um, you know, they, they kind of walk a bit, whereas this goes around, uh, I think it's, it, it's almost 200 meters an hour, so it's quite fast. Um, that's the Earth's um, plasma. Um, so there was an ultraviolet um, imager on, on the rover, and uh, we've seen some very good images of the, the magnetosphere around the Earth. Um, some very amazing um, you know, full panoramic views uh, from the rover and lander. So is it easy? Not so much, really, because this is what the, the rover sent back on 28th of January. So I'll read it out if you can't uh, see it from the back. It said, this is space exploration. The danger comes with its beauty. I am but a tiny dot in the vast picture of mankind's adventure in space. The sun has fallen and the temperature is dropping so quickly. To tell you all the secret, I don't feel that sad. I'm just in my own adventure story, and like a hero, I encountered a small problem. Good night, uh, good night, <coughs> humanity. So we'll still find out, if, you know, there is still hope uh, that it will wake up on 8th of February, but this is, um, and if you do follow uh, Weibo, if you can't read the Chinese characters, you can look for the really cute uh, rabbit symbol. <laughs> Um, I won't go too much into, into uh, my future slides because Bernard has uh, painted a very complete and, and brilliant picture of it. Um, let me just uh, rush to one thing though. I tried to uh, map out uh, any of the missing, so this is an a, a infographic somebody did around uh, all the, so all, all the um, rovers, the missions that have gone around the moon and actually all the crash landed sort of uh, uh, you know, sites at the moon. And for me, it's, it's a little sad because, um, you know, it feels like a graveyard of, of robots and robots, <laughs> which isn't very, like I said, it's, it's quite sad. Um, but if you do end up in the Republic of the Moon, on the moon, then please take a metal detector because you'll find a lot of things. Um, and I've tried to map out some of the new ones, um, and hopefully this chart will grow. But ultimately, there are, um, China, India, and uh, Russia, uh, again, Bernard did cover this in, in some detail, so um, are going back to the moon. And I think there is this new decade that does start off from uh, 2015 onwards, and there's several private entity players like the Google Lunar X, <coughs> X Prize teams that will also land their um, missions on the moon. Um, there's some further capabilities um, being worked on in terms of creating almost an uh, interplanetary highway, I would say, more capabilities to launch and land on the moon. And we do hope that there will be an international lunar village on the moon working together to create um, bases for us because going to Mars is not easy, and we will need somewhere to, to really train ourselves. Just to end, um, this, is, this was the words of Michael Collins, um, af, you know, um, sort of after Apollo 11, and uh, he said, I think a future flight should include a poet, a priest, and a philosopher. We might just, uh, we might get a much better idea of what we saw. So I hope you get involved um, by, through the suggestions of the activities that Bernard shared earlier and in creating art projects and helping to communicate the data that came out of these missions to the links that I have had. But that's, that's it. Great, thank you very much, Reed.